he walked around the horses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tabitha. He walked around the horses by H. Beam Piper. This tale is based on an authenticated, documented fact. A man vanished right out of this world. And where he went? In November 1809 an Englishman named Benjamin Bathurst vanished inexplicably and utterly. He was en route to Hamburg from Vienna, where he had been serving as his government's envoy to the court of what Napoleon had left of the Austrian Empire. At an inn in Perleberg, in Prussia, while examining a change of horses for his coach, he casually stepped out of sight of his secretary and his valet. He was not seen to leave the inn-yard. He was not seen again, ever. At least, not in this continuum. From Baron Eugen von Krutz, Minister of Police, to His Excellency the Count von Berchtenwald, Chancellor to His Majesty Friedrich Wilhelm III of Prussia, 25th of November, 1809. Your Excellency, a circumstance has come to the notice of this ministry, the significance of which I am at a loss to define, but since it appears to involve matters of state, both here and abroad, I am convinced that it is of sufficient importance to be brought to your personal attention. Frankly, I am unwilling to take any further action in the matter without your advice. Briefly, the situation is this. We are holding, here at the Ministry of Police, a person giving his name as Benjamin Bathurst, who claims to be a British diplomat. This person was taken into custody by the police at Perleberg yesterday, as the result of a disturbance at an inn there. He is being detained on technical charges of causing disorder in a public place, and of being a suspicious person. When arrested, he had in his possession a dispatch-case containing a number of papers. These are of such an extraordinary nature that the local authorities declined to assume any responsibility beyond having the man sent here to Berlin. After interviewing this person and examining his papers, I am, I must confess, in much the same position. This is not, I am convinced, any ordinary police matter. There is something very strange and disturbing here. The man's statements, taken alone, are so incredible as to justify the assumption that he is mad. I cannot, however, adopt this theory, in view of his demeanour, which is that of a man of perfect rationality, and because of the existence of these papers. The whole thing is mad, incomprehensible. The papers in question accompany, along with copies of the various statements taken at Perleberg, a personal letter to me from my nephew, Lieutenant Rudolf von Talberg. This last is deserving of your particular attention. Lieutenant von Talberg is a very level-headed young officer, not at all inclined to be fanciful or imaginative. It would take a good deal to affect him as he describes. The man calling himself Benjamin Bathurst is now lodged in an apartment here at the Ministry. He is being treated with every consideration, and except for freedom of movement, accorded every privilege. I am most anxiously awaiting your advice, etc., etc. Krutz. Report of Traugott Zeller, Oberwachtmeister, Satzpolizei, made at Perleberg, 25th of November, 1809. At about ten minutes past two of the afternoon of Saturday, the 25th of November, while I was at the police station, there entered a man known to me as Franz Bauer, an inn-servant employed by Christian Hauck at the sign of the Sword and Sceptre here in Perleberg. This man, Franz Bauer, made complaint to Staatspolizei Captain Ernst Hartenstein, saying that there was a madman making trouble at the inn where he, Franz Bauer, worked. I was therefore directed by Staatspolizei Kapitan Hartenstein to go to the Sword and Sceptre Inn, there to act at discretion to maintain the peace. Arriving at the inn in company with the said Franz Bauer, I found a considerable crowd of people in the common room, and in the midst of them the innkeeper, Christian Hauck, in altercation with a stranger. This stranger was a gentlemanly appearing person dressed in travelling clothes, who had under his arm a small leather dispatch case. As I entered, I could hear him speaking in German with a strong English accent, abusing the innkeeper, the said Christian Hauck, and accusing him of having drugged his, the stranger's wine, and of having stolen his, the stranger's coach and four, and of having abducted his, the stranger's secretary and servants. This the said Christian Hauck was loudly denying, and the other people in the inn were taking the innkeeper's part, and mocking the stranger for a madman. On entering, I commanded every one to be silent in the King's name and then, as he appeared to be the complaining party of the dispute, I required the foreign gentleman to state to me what was the trouble. He then repeated his accusations against the innkeeper, Hauck, saying that Hauck, 
or rather another man who resembled Hauck and who had claimed to be the innkeeper, had drugged his wine and stolen his coach, and made off with his secretary and his servants. At this point the innkeeper and the bystanders all began shouting denials and contradictions, so that I had to pound on a table with my truncheon to command silence. I then required the innkeeper, Christian Hauck, to answer the charges which the stranger had made. This he did with a complete denial of all of them, saying that the stranger had had no wine in his inn, that he had not been inside the inn until a few minutes before, when he had burst in shouting accusations, and that there had been no secretary, and no valet, and no coachman, and no coach and four at the inn, and that the gentleman was raving mad. To all this he called the people who were in the common room to witness. I then required the stranger to account for himself. He said that his name was Benjamin Bathurst, and that he was a British diplomat returning to England from Vienna. To prove this, he produced from his dispatch-case sundry papers. One of these was a letter of safe conduct issued by the Prussian Chancellery, in which he was named and described as Benjamin Bathurst. The other papers were English, all bearing seals, and appearing to be official documents. Accordingly, I requested him to accompany me to the police-station, and also the innkeeper, and three men whom the innkeeper wanted to bring as witnesses. Traugott Zeller, Oberwachtmeister. Report approved. Ernst Hartenstein, Staatspolizei Kapitan. Statement of the self-so-called Benjamin Bathurst, taken at the police station at Perleberg, 25th of November, 1809. My name is Benjamin Bathurst, and I am envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary of the government of His Britannic Majesty to the court of His Majesty Franz I, Emperor of Austria, or at least I was until the events following the Austrian surrender made necessary my return to London. I left Vienna on the morning of Monday the 20th to go to Hamburg to take ship home. I was travelling in my own coach and four with my secretary, Mr. Bertram Jardine, and my valet, William Small, both British subjects, and a coachman, Josef Bidek, an Austrian subject, whom I had hired for the trip. Because of the presence of French troops, whom I was anxious to avoid, I was forced to make a detour west as far as Salzburg before turning north towards Magdeburg, where I crossed the Elbe. I was unable to get a change of horses for my coach after leaving Gera till I reached Perleberg, where I stopped at the Sword and Sceptre Inn. Arriving there, I left my coach in the inn-yard, and I and my secretary, Mr. Jardine, went into the inn. A man, not this fellow here, but another rogue, with more beard and less paunch, and more shabbily dress, but as like him as though he were his brother, represented himself as the innkeeper and I dealt with him for a change of horses, and ordered a bottle of wine for myself and my secretary, and also a pot of beer apiece for my valet and the coachman, to be taken outside to them. Then Jardine and I sat down to our wine at a table in the common room, until the man who claimed to be the innkeeper came back and told us that the fresh horses were harnessed to the coach and ready to go. Then we went outside again. I looked at the two horses on the off-side, and then walked around in front of the team to look at the two nigh-side horses and as I did, I felt giddy as though I were about to fall, and everything went black before my eyes. I thought I was having a fainting spell, something I am not at all subject to, and I put out my hand to grasp the hitching-bar, but could not find it. I am sure now that I was unconscious for some time, because when my head cleared, the coach and horses were gone, and in their place was a big farm-wagon, jacked up in front, with the right front wheel off, and two peasants were greasing the detached wheel. I looked at them for a moment, unable to credit my eyes, and then I spoke to them in German, saying, "'Where the devil's my coach and four? They both straightened, startled. The one who was holding the wheel almost dropped it. "'Pardon, Excellency,' he said. "'There's been no coach and four here all the time we've been here.' "'Yes,' said his mate, "'and we've been here since just afternoon.' I did not attempt to argue with them. It occurred to me, and it is still my opinion, that I was the victim of some plot— that my wine had been drugged, that I had been unconscious for some time, during which my coach had been removed and this wagon substituted for it, and that these peasants had been put to work on it and instructed what to say if questioned. If my arrival at the inn had been anticipated and everything put in readiness, the whole business would not have taken ten minutes. I therefore entered the inn, determined to have it out with this rascally innkeeper, but when I returned to the common room he was nowhere to be seen and this other fellow, who is given his name as Christian Hauck, claimed to be the innkeeper, and denied knowledge of any of the things I've just stated. Furthermore, there were four cavalrymen, Uhlans, drinking beer and playing cards at the table where Jardine and I had had our wine, and they claimed to have been there for several hours. 
I have no idea why such an elaborate prank, involving the participation of many people, should be played on me, except at the instigation of the French. In that case, I cannot understand why Prussian soldiers should lend themselves to it. Benjamin Bathurst Statement of Christian Hauck, innkeeper, taken at the police station at Perleberg, 25th of November, 1809. May it please your honour, my name is Christian Hauck, and I keep an inn at the sign of the sword and sceptre, and have these past fifteen years, and my father and his father before me, for the past fifty years, and never has there been complaint like this against my inn. Your honour, it is a hard thing for a man who keeps a decent house, and pays his taxes, and obeys the laws, to be accused of crimes of this sort. I know nothing of this gentleman, nor of his coach, nor his secretary, nor his servants. I never set eyes on him before he came bursting into the inn from the yard, shouting and raving like a madman, and crying out, "'Where the devil's that rogue of an innkeeper?' I said to him, "'I'm the innkeeper. What cause have you to call me a rogue, sir?' The stranger replied, "'You're not the innkeeper I did business with a few minutes ago, and he's the rascal I want to see.' I want to know what the devil's been done with my coach, and what's happened to my secretary and my servants. I tried to tell him that I knew nothing of what he was talking about, but he would not listen, and gave me the lie, saying that he had been drugged and robbed, and his people kidnapped. He even had the impudence to claim that he and his secretary had been sitting at a table in that room drinking wine not fifteen minutes before, when there had been four non-commissioned officers of the Third Uhlans at that table since noon. Everybody in the room spoke up for me, but he would not listen, and was shouting that we were all robbers and kidnappers and French spies and I don't know what all, when the police came. Your Honour, the man is mad. What I have told you about this is the truth, and all that I know about this business, so help me God. Christian Hauck Statement of Franz Bauer, in-servant, taken at the police station at Perleberg, 25th of November, 1809. May it please your honour, my name is Franz Bauer, and I am a servant at the Sword and Sceptre Inn kept by Christian Hauck. This afternoon, when I went into the inn-yard to empty a bucket of slops on the dung-heap by the stables, I heard voices and turned around, to see this gentleman speaking to Wilhelm Beick and Fritz Herzer, who were greasing their wagon in the yard. He had not been in the yard when I had turned away to empty the bucket, and I thought that he must have come in from the street. This gentleman was asking Bike and Herza where was his coach, and when they told him they didn't know, he turned and ran into the inn. Of my own knowledge, the man had not been inside the inn before then, nor had there been any coach or any of the people he spoke of at the inn, and none of the things he spoke of happened there, for otherwise I would know, since I was at the inn all day. When I went back inside, I found him in the common room, shouting at my master, and claiming that he had been drugged and robbed. I saw that he was mad, and was afraid that he would do some mischief, so I went for the police. Franz Bauer, his ex, Mark. Statements of Wilhelm Beick and Fritz Herzer, peasants, taken at the police station at Perleberg, 25th of November, 1809. May it please your honour, my name is Wilhelm Beick, and I am attendant on the estate of the Baron von Hentig. On this day, I and Fritz Herzer were sent into Perleberg with a load of potatoes and cabbages, which the innkeeper at the Sword and Sceptre had brought from the estate superintendent. After we had unloaded them, we decided to grease our wagon, which was very dry, before going back, so we unhitched and began working on it. We took about two hours, starting just after we'd eaten lunch, and in all that time there was no coach and four in the inn-yard. We were just finishing when this gentleman spoke to us, demanding to know where his coach was. We told him that there had been no coach in the yard all the time we'd been there, so he turned around and ran into the inn. At the time I thought that he'd come out of the inn before speaking to us, for I know that he could not have come in from the street. Now I do not know where he came from, but I know that I never saw him before that moment. Wilhelm Beick, his ex, Mark. I have heard the above testimony, and it is true to my own knowledge, and I have nothing to add to it. Fritz Herzer, his ex Mark. From Staatspolizei Kapitan Ernst Hartenstein to His Excellency the Baron von Krutz, Minister of Police. 25th of November, 1809. Your Excellency. The accompanying copies of statements taken this day will explain how the prisoner, the self so called Benjamin Bathurst, came into my custody. I have charged him with causing disorder and being a suspicious person to hold him until more can be learned about him. 
However, as he represents himself to be a British diplomat, I am unwilling to assume any further responsibility, and am having him sent to Your Excellency in Berlin. In the first place, Your Excellency, I have the strongest doubts of the man's story. The statement which he made before me and signed is bad enough, with the coach and four turning into a farm-wagon, like Cinderella's coach into a pumpkin, and three people vanishing as though swallowed by the earth. But all this is perfectly reasonable and credible beside the things he said to me, of which no record was made. Your Excellency will have noticed in his statement certain allusions to the Austrian surrender, and to French troops in Austria. After his statement had been taken down, I noticed these allusions, and I inquired what surrender, and what were French troops doing in Austria. The man looked at me in a pitying manner, and said, "'You seem to travel slowly hereabouts. Peace was concluded at Vienna on the 14th of last month, and as for what French troops are doing in Austria, they are doing the same things Bonaparte's brigands are doing everywhere in Europe.' "'And who is Bonaparte?' I asked. He stared at me as though I'd asked him, "'Who is the Lord Jehovah?' Then, after a moment, a look of comprehension came into his face. "'So you Prussians concede him the title of Emperor, and refer to him as Napoleon,' he said. "'Well, I can assure you that His Britannic Majesty's government haven't done so, and never will. Not so long as one Englishman has a finger left to pull a trigger. General Bonaparte is a usurper. His Britannic Majesty's government do not recognise any sovereignty in France except the House of Bourbon.' This he said very sternly, as though rebuking me. It took me a moment or so to digest that, and to appreciate all its implications. Why, this fellow evidently believed, as a matter of fact, that the French monarchy had been overthrown by some military adventurer named Bonaparte, who was calling himself the Emperor Napoleon, and who had made war on Austria and forced a surrender. I made no attempt to argue with him, one wastes time arguing with madmen, but if this man could believe that, the transformation of a coach and four into a cabbage-wagon was a small matter indeed. So to humour him, I asked if he thought General Bonaparte's agents were responsible for his trouble at the inn. Certainly, he replied. The chances are they don't know me to see me, and took Jardine for the minister and me for the secretary, so they made off with poor Jardine. I wonder, though, that they left me my dispatch case. And that reminds me, I'll want that back, diplomatic papers, you know. I told him very seriously that we would have to check his credentials. I promised him I would make every effort to locate his secretary and his servants and his coach, took a complete description of all of them, and persuaded him to go into an upstairs room, where I kept him under guard. I did start inquiries, calling in all my informers and spies, but as I expected I could learn nothing. I could not find anybody even who had seen him anywhere in Perleburg before he appeared at the Sword and Sceptre, and that rather surprised me, as somebody should have seen him enter the town or walk along the street. In this connection, let me remind Your Excellency of the discrepancy in the statements of the servant, Franz Bauer, and of the two peasants. The former is certain the man entered the inn-yard from the street, the latter are just as positive that he did not. Your Excellency, I do not like such puzzles, for I am sure that all three were telling the truth to the best of their knowledge. They are ignorant common folk, I admit, but they should know what they did or did not see. After I got the prisoner into safekeeping, I fell to examining his papers, and I can assure Your Excellency that they gave me a shock. I had paid little heed to his ravings about the King of France being dethroned, or about this General Bonaparte who called himself the Emperor Napoleon, but I found all these things mentioned in his papers and dispatches which had every appearance of being official documents. There was repeated mention of the taking by the French of Vienna last May, and of the capitulation of the Austrian Emperor to this General Bonaparte, and of battles being fought all over Europe, and I don't know what other fantastic things. Your Excellency, I have heard of all sorts of madmen, one believing himself to be the Archangel Gabriel, or Mohammed, or a werewolf, and another convinced that his bones are made of glass, or that he is pursued and tormented by devils. But so help me God, this is the first time I have heard of a madman who had documentary proof for his delusions. Does Your Excellency wonder, then, that I want no part of this business? But the matter of his credentials was even worse. He had papers sealed with the seal of the British Foreign Office, and to every appearance genuine, but they were signed as Foreign Minister by one George Canning, and all the world knows that Lord Castlereagh has been Foreign Minister these last five years. And to cap it all, he had a safe conduct, sealed with the seal of the Prussian Chancellery, 
the very seal, for I compared it under a strong magnifying glass with one that I knew to be genuine, and they were identical. And yet this letter was signed as Chancellor, not by Count von Berchtenwald, but by Baron Stein, the Minister of Agriculture, and the signature, as far as I could see, appeared to be genuine. This is too much for me, Your Excellency. I must ask to be excused from dealing with this matter before I become as mad as my prisoner. I made arrangements accordingly with Colonel Keitel of the Third Uhlans to furnish an officer to escort this man into Berlin. The coach in which they come belongs to this police station, and the driver is one of my men. He should be furnished expense money to get back to Perleberg. The guard is a corporal of Uhlans, the orderly of the officer. He will stay with the Herr Oberleutnant, and both of them will return here at their own convenience and expense. I have the honour, Your Excellency, to be etc. etc. and Tartenstein, Staatspolizei Kapitan. From Oberleutnant Rudolf von Thalberg to Baron Eugen von Krutz. 26th of November, 1809. Dear Uncle Eugen, this is in no sense a formal report. I made that at the Ministry when I turned the Englishman and his papers over to one of your officers, a fellow with red hair and a face like a bulldog. But there are a few things which you should be told which wouldn't look well in an official report, to let you know just what sort of a rare fish has got into your net. I'd just come in from drilling my platoon yesterday when Colonel Keitel's orderly told me that the Colonel wanted to see me in his quarters. I found the old fellow in undress in his sitting-room smoking his big pipe. "'Come in, Lieutenant. Come in and sit down, my boy.' He greeted me in that bluff, hearty manner which he always adopts with his junior officers when he has some particularly nasty job to be done. "'How would you like to take a little trip into Berlin? I have an errand which won't take half an hour, and you can stay as long as you like, just so you're back by Thursday when your turn comes up for road patrol.' "'Well, I thought this is the bait.' I waited to see what the hook would look like, saying that it was entirely agreeable with me, and asking what his errand was. "'Well, it isn't for myself, Talberg,' he said. "'It's for this fellow Hartenstein, the Stutzpolizei Kapitan here. It's something he wants done at the Ministry of Police, and I thought of you, because I've heard you're related to the Baron von Krutz. You are, aren't you?' he asked, just as though he didn't know all about who all his officers are related to. "'That's right, Colonel. The Baron is my uncle,' I said. What does Hartenstein want done? Why, he has a prisoner whom he wants taken to Berlin and turned over at the Ministry. All you have to do is to take him in, in a coach, and see he doesn't escape on the way, and get a receipt for him, and for some papers. This is a very important prisoner. I don't think Hartenstein has any one he can trust to handle him. The prisoner claims to be some sort of a British diplomat, and for all Hartenstein knows, maybe he is. Also, he's a madman. A madman? I echoed. "'Yes, just so. At least that's what Hartenstein told me. I wanted to know what sort of a madman. There are various kinds of madmen, all of whom must be handled differently. But all Hartenstein would tell me was that he had unrealistic beliefs about the state of affairs in Europe.' "'Ha! What diplomat hasn't?' I asked. Old Keitel gave a laugh somewhere between the bark of a dog and the croaking of a raven. "'Yes, exactly. The unrealistic beliefs of diplomats are what soldiers die of,' he said. I said as much to Hartenstein, but he wouldn't tell me anything more. He seemed to regret having said even that much. He looked like a man who seen a particularly terrifying ghost. The old man puffed hard at his famous pipe for a while, blowing smoke through his moustache. "'Rudy, Hartenstein has pulled a hot potato out of the ashes this time, and he wants to toss it to your uncle before it burns his fingers. I think that's one reason why he got me to furnish an escort for his Englishman. Now look.' You must take this unrealistic diplomat, or this undiplomatic madman, or whatever in blazes he is, into Berlin. And understand this—he pointed his pipe at me as though it were a pistol—your orders are to take him there and turn him over at the Ministry of Police. Nothing has been said about whether you turn him over alive or dead, or half one and half the other. I know nothing about this business, and want to know nothing. If Hartenstein wants us to play jail warders for him, then he must be satisfied with our way of doing it. Well, to cut short the story, I looked at the coach Hartenstein had placed at my disposal, and I decided to chain the left door shut on the outside, so that it couldn't be opened from within. Then I would put my prisoner on my left, so that the only way out would be past me. I decided not to carry any weapons which he might be able to snatch from me, so I took off my sabre and locked it in the seat-box, along with the dispatch-case containing the Englishman's papers. 
It was cold enough to wear a greatcoat in comfort, so I wore mine, and in the right side pocket where my prisoner couldn't reach I put a little leaded bludgeon, and also a brace of pocket pistols. Hartenstein was going to furnish me a guard as well as a driver, but I said that I'd take a servant who could act as guard. The servant, of course, was my orderly, old Johann. I gave him my double hunting-gun to carry with a big charge of boar shot in one barrel and an ounce ball in the other. In addition, I armed myself with a big bottle of cognac. I thought that if I could shoot my prisoner often enough with that, he would give me no trouble. As it happened, he didn't, and none of my precautions, except the cognac, were needed. The man didn't look like a lunatic to me. He was a rather stout gentleman of past middle age, with a ruddy complexion and an intelligent face. The only unusual thing about him was his hat, which was a peculiar contraption looking like a pot. I put him in the carriage, and then offered him a drink out of my bottle, taking one about half as big myself. He smacked his lips over it, and said, "'Well, that's real brandy. Whatever we think of their detestable politics, we can't criticise the French for their liquor.' Then he said, "'I'm glad they're sending me in the custody of a military gentleman, instead of a confounded gendarme. Tell me the truth, Lieutenant. Am I under arrest for anything?' "'Why,' I said, "'Captain Hartenstein should have told you about that. All I know is that I have orders to take you to the Ministry of Police in Berlin, and not to let you escape on the way. These orders I will carry out. I hope you don't hold that against me.' He assured me that he did not, and we had another drink on it. I made sure again that he got twice as much as I did, and then the coachman cracked his whip, and we were off for Berlin. Now, I thought, I'm going to see just what sort of a madman this is, and why Hartenstein is making a state affair out of a squabble at an inn. So I decided to explore his unrealistic beliefs about the state of affairs in Europe. After guiding the conversation to where I wanted it, I asked him, what, Herr Bathurst, in your belief, is the real underlying cause of the present tragic situation in Europe? That, I thought, was safe enough. Name me one year since the days of Julius Caesar, when the situation in Europe hasn't been tragic. And it worked to perfection. In my belief, says this Englishman, the whole mess is the result of the victory of the rebellious colonists in North America and their blasted republic. Well, you can imagine that gave me a start. All the world knows that the American patriots lost their war for independence from England, that their army was shattered, that their leaders were either killed or driven into exile. How many times, when I was a little boy, did I not sit up long past my bedtime, when old Baron von Steuben was a guest at Talberg Schloss, listening open-mouthed and wide-eyed to his stories of that gallant lost struggle? How I used to shiver at his tales of the terrible winter camp, or thrill at the battles, or weep as he told how he held the dying Washington in his arms, and listened to his noble last words at the Battle of Doylestown. And here this man was telling me that the Patriots had really won, and set up the Republic for which they had fought. I had been prepared for some of what Hartenstein had called unrealistic beliefs, but nothing as fantastic as this. "'I can cut it even finer than that,' Bathurst continued. "'It was the defeat of Burgoyne at Saratoga.' We made a good bargain when we got Benedict Arnold to turn his coat, but we didn't do it soon enough. If he hadn't been on the field that day, Burgoyne would have gone through Gates' army like a hot knife through butter. But Arnold hadn't been at Saratoga. I know. I've read much of the American War. Arnold was shot dead on New Year's Day of 1776 during the storming of Quebec. And Burgoyne had done just as Bathurst had said. He'd gone through Gates like a knife and down the Hudson to join Howe. "'But Herr Bathurst, I asked, how could that affect the situation in Europe? America is thousands of miles away across the ocean. Ideas can cross oceans quicker than armies. When Louis the Sixteenth decided to come to the aid of the Americans, he doomed himself and his regime. A successful resistance to royal authority in America was all the French Republicans needed to inspire them. Of course we have Louis's own weakness to blame, too. If he'd given those rascals a whiff of grapeshot when the mob tried to storm Versailles in 1790, there'd have been no French Revolution. But he had. When Louis the Sixteenth ordered the Howitzers turned on the mob at Versailles, and then sent the dragoons to ride down the survivors, the Republican movement had been broken. That had been when Cardinal Talleyrand, who was then merely Bishop of Autun, had come to the fore and become the power that he is today in France, the greatest King's minister since Richelieu. "'And after that Louis's death followed as surely as night after day,' Bathurst was saying. 
and because the French had no experience in self-government, their republic was foredoomed. If Bonaparte hadn't seized power, somebody else would have. When the French murdered their king, they delivered themselves to dictatorship, and a dictator, unsupported by the prestige of royalty, has no choice but to lead his people into foreign war, to keep them from turning upon him. It was like that all the way to Berlin. All these things seem foolish by daylight, but as I sat in the darkness of that swaying coach, I was almost convinced of the reality of what he told me. I tell you, Uncle Eugen, it was frightening, as though he were giving me a view of hell. Got in Himmel the things that man talked of! Armies swarming over Europe, sack and massacre and cities burning, blockades and starvation, kings deposed, and thrones tumbling like tenpins! Battles in which the soldiers of every nation fought, and in which tens of thousands were mowed down like ripe grain! And over all the satanic figure of a little man in a grey coat, who dictated peace to the Austrian Emperor in Schönbrunn, and carried the Pope away a prisoner to Savona! "'Madmen, eh? Unrealistic belief,' says Hartenstein. "'Well, give me madmen who drool spittle and foam at the mouth and shriek obscene blasphemies, but not this pleasant-seeming gentleman who sat beside me and talked of horrors in a quiet, cultured voice while he drank my cognac. "'But not all my cognac. If your man at the Ministry, the one with red hair and the bulldog face, tells you that I was drunk when I brought in that Englishman, you had better believe him. Rudy. From Count von Berchtenwald to the British Minister, 28th of November, 1809. Honoured Sir, The accompanying dossier will acquaint you with the problem confronting this Chancellery, without needless repetition on my part. Please to understand that it is not, and never was, any part of the intentions of the Government of His Majesty Friedrich Wilhelm III, to offer any injury or indignity to the Government of His Britannic Majesty George III. We would never contemplate holding in arrest the person or tampering with the papers of an accredited envoy of your government. However, we have the gravest doubt to make a considerable understatement that this person, who calls himself Benjamin Bathurst, is any such envoy, and we do not think that it would be any service to the government of His Britannic Majesty to allow an impostor to travel about Europe in the guise of a British diplomatic representative. We certainly should not thank the Government of His Britannic Majesty for failing to take steps to deal with some person who, in England, might falsely represent himself to be a Prussian diplomat. This affair touches us as closely as it does your own Government. This man had in his possession a letter of safe conduct, which you will find in the accompanying dispatch case. It is of the regular form, as issued by this Chancellery, and is sealed with the Chancellery seal, or with a very exact counterfeit of it. However, it has been signed as Chancellor of Prussia, with a signature indistinguishable from that of the Baron Stein, who is the present Prussian Minister for Agriculture. Baron Stein was shown the signature with the rest of the letter covered, and without hesitation acknowledged it for his own writing. However, when the letter was uncovered and shown to him, his surprise and horror were such as would require the pen of a Goethe or a Schiller to describe, and he denied categorically ever having seen the document before. I have no choice but to believe him. It's impossible to think that a man of Baron Stein's honourable and serious character would be party to the fabrication of a paper of this sort. Even aside from this, I am in the thing as deeply as he is. If it is signed with his signature, it is also sealed with my seal, which has not been out of my personal keeping in the ten years that I have been Chancellor here. In fact, the word impossible can be used to describe the entire business. It was impossible for the man Benjamin Bathurst to have entered the inn-yard, yet he did. It was impossible that he should carry papers of the sort found in his dispatch-case, or that such papers should exist, yet I am sending them to you with this letter. It is impossible that Baron von Stein would sign a paper of the sort he did, or that it should be sealed by the Chancellery, yet it bears both signed signature and my steel. You will also find in the dispatch-case other credentials, ostensibly originating with the British Foreign Office, of the same character being signed by persons having no connection with the Foreign Office, or even with the Government, but being sealed with apparently authentic seals. If you send these papers to London, I fancy you will find that they will there create the same situation as that caused here by this letter of safe conduct. I am also sending you a charcoal sketch of the person who calls himself Benjamin Bathurst. This portrait was taken without its subject's knowledge. Baron von Krutz's nephew, Lieutenant von Talberg, who is the son of our mutual friend Count von Talberg, has a little friend, a very clever young lady, who is, as you will see, an expert at this sort of work. 
She was introduced into a room at the Ministry of Police and placed behind a screen where she could sketch our prisoner's face. If you should send this picture to London, I think that there is a good chance that it might be recognised. I can vouch that it is an excellent likeness. To tell the truth, we are at our wit's end about this affair. I cannot understand how such excellent imitations of these various seals could be made, and the signature of the Baron von Stein is the most expert forgery that I have ever seen in thirty years' experience as a statesman. This would indicate careful and painstaking work on the part of somebody. How, then, do we reconcile this with such clumsy mistakes, recognisable as such by any schoolboy, assigning the name of Baron Stein as Prussian Chancellor, or Mr. George Canning, who is a member of the Opposition Party and not connected with your Government, as British Foreign Secretary? These are mistakes which only a madman would make. There are those who think our prisoner is mad because of his apparent delusions about the great conqueror General Bonaparte, alias the Emperor Napoleon. Madmen have been known to fabricate evidence to support their delusions, it's true, but I shudder to think of a madman having at his disposal resources to manufacture the papers you will find in this dispatch-case. Moreover, some of our foremost medical men, who have specialised in the disorders of the mind, have interviewed this man Bathurst, and say that, save for his fixed belief in a non-existent situation, he is perfectly sane. Personally, I believe that the whole thing is a gigantic hoax, perpetrated for some hidden and sinister purpose, possibly to create confusion, and to undermine the confidence existing between your government and mine, and to set against one another various persons connected with both governments, or else as a mask for some other conspiratorial activity. Only a few months ago, you will recall, there was a Jacobin plot unmasked at Colm. But whatever this business may portend, I do not like it. I want to get to the bottom of it as soon as possible, and I will thank you, my dear sir, and your government, for any assistance you may find possible. I have the honour, sir, to be, etc., 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 Berchtenwald. From Baron von Krutz to the Count von Berchtenwald, most urgent, most important, to be delivered immediately and in person, regardless of circumstances. 28th of November, 1809. Count von Berchtenwald. Within the past half-hour, that is, at about eleven o'clock to-night, the man calling himself Benjamin Bathurst was shot and killed by a sentry at the Ministry of Police, while attempting to escape from custody. A sentry on duty in the rear courtyard of the Ministry observed a man attempting to leave the building in a suspicious and furtive manner. This sentry, who was under the strictest orders to allow no one to enter or leave without written authorization, challenged him. When he attempted to run, the sentry fired his musket at him, bringing him down. At the shot, the sergeant of the guard rushed into the courtyard with his detail, and the man whom the sentry had shot was found to be the Englishman, Benjamin Bathurst. He had been hit in the chest with an ounce ball, and died before the doctor could arrive, and without recovering consciousness. An investigation revealed that the prisoner, who was confined to the third floor of the building, had fashioned a rope from his bedding, his bed-cord, and the leather strap of his bell-pull. This rope was only long enough to reach to the window of the office on the second floor directly below, but he managed to enter this by kicking the glass out of the window. I am trying to find out how he could do this without being heard. I can assure you that somebody is going to smart for this night's work. As for the sentry, he acted within his orders. I have commended him for doing his duty and for good shooting, and I assume full responsibility for the death of the prisoner at his hands. I have no idea why the self-so-called Benjamin Bathurst, who until now was well behaved and seemed to take his confinement philosophically, should suddenly make this rash and fatal attempt, unless it was because of those infernal dunderheads of madhouse doctors who have been bothering him. Only this afternoon they deliberately handed him a bundle of newspapers, Prussian, Austrian, French and English, all dated within the last month. They wanted, they said, to see how he would react. Well, God pardon them, they found out. What do you think should be done about giving the body burial? Krutz. From the British Minister to the Count von Berchtenwald. December the 20th, 1809. My dear Count von Berchtenwald, Reply from London to my letter of the 28th, which accompanied the dispatch case and the other papers, has finally come to hand. The papers which you wanted returned, the copies of the statements taken at Perleburg, the letter to the Baron von Krutz from the police captain Hartenstein, and the personal letter of Krutz's nephew, Lieutenant von Talberg, and the letter of safe conduct found in the dispatch case accompany herewith. I don't know what the people at Whitehall did with the other papers, tossed them into the nearest fire, for my guess. Were I in your place, that's where the papers I am returning would go. 
I have heard nothing yet from my dispatch of the twenty-ninth concerning the death of the man who called himself Benjamin Bathurst, but I doubt very much if any official notice will ever be taken of it. Your government had a perfect right to detain the fellow, and that being the case, he attempted to escape at his own risk. After all, sentries are not required to carry loaded muskets in order to discourage them from putting their hands in their pockets. To hazard a purely unofficial opinion, I should not imagine that London is very much dissatisfied with this denouement. His Majesty's Government are a hard-headed and matter-of-fact set of gentry who do not relish mysteries, least of all mysteries whose solution may be more disturbing than the original problem. This is entirely confidential, but those papers which were in that dispatch case kicked up the devil's own row in London, with half the government bigwigs protesting their innocence to high heaven, and the rest accusing one another of complicity in the hoax. If that was somebody's intention, it was literally a howling success. For a while it was even feared that there would be questions in Parliament, but eventually the whole vexatious business was hushed. You may tell Count Talberg's son that his little friend is a most talented young lady. Her sketch was highly commended by no less an authority than Sir Thomas Lawrence. And here comes the most bedevilling part of a thoroughly bedevilled business. The picture was instantly recognised. It is a very fair likeness of Benjamin Bathurst, or should I say Sir Benjamin Bathurst, who is King's Lieutenant Governor for the Crown Colony of Georgia. As Sir Thomas Lawrence did his portrait a few years back, he is in an excellent position to criticise the work of Lieutenant von Talberg's young lady. However, Sir Benjamin Bathurst was known to have been in Savannah, attending to the duties of his office, and in the public eye, all the while that his double was in Prussia. Sir Benjamin does not have a twin brother. It has been suggested that this fellow might be a half-brother, but as far as I know there is no justification for this theory. The General Bonaparte, alias the Emperor Napoleon, who is given so much mention in the dispatches, seems also to have a counterpart in actual life. There is, in the French army, a colonel of artillery by that name, a Corsican who gallicized his original name of Napoleone Buonaparte. He is a most brilliant military theoretician. I am sure some of your own officers, like General Scharnhorst, could tell you about him. His loyalty to the French monarchy has never been questioned. This same correspondence to facts seems to crop up everywhere in that amazing collection of pseudo-dispatches and pseudo-state papers. The United States of America, you will recall, was the style by which the rebellious colonies referred to themselves in the Declaration of Philadelphia. The James Madison, who is mentioned as the current President of the United States, is now living in exile in Switzerland. His alleged predecessor in office, Thomas Jefferson, was the author of the Rebel Declaration. After the defeat of the rebels, he escaped to Havana, and died several years ago in the Principality of Liechtenstein. I was quite amused to find our old friend Cardinal Talleyrand, without the ecclesiastical title, cast in the role of chief adviser to the usurper Bonaparte. His eminence, I have always thought, is the sort of fellow who would land on his feet on top of any heap, and who would as little scruple to be Prime Minister to his Satanic Majesty as to his Most Christian Majesty. I was baffled, however, by one name frequently mentioned in these fantastic papers. This was the English General Wellington. I haven't the least idea who this person might be. I have the honour, Your Excellency, etc., 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 Sir Arthur Wellesley. End of He Walked Around the Horses by H. Beam Piper